him now. Hi. Uh, so um, greetings from San Francisco. Um, it's a little brighter here. I hear it's much cooler here than in New Jersey, New Jersey right now. I hear it's quite warm there uh, based on one of my coworkers who's, I think, a little bit north of you folks. Um, well, I don't know exactly where everyone in this meetup is distributed, but I know that the event I was originally going to present at was at Princeton. The um, Just to answer the intro questions, um, I have actually not used Docker, but I am a maintainer of one of the foundational technologies that runs Podman. Um, so uh, I was excited to hear someone uh, mention uh, wanting to hack on that. Uh, I'm quite fond of uh, Podman's architecture, especially in how it can run containers completely in user uh, in the user scope without root. Um, and um, although that mode is not completely compatible with Docker, but uh, it's um, it's something I've played around with quite a bit, and we. Um, we use some related technology at Pantheon where we run run C for most of our containers, which is also built on top of the same foundation as Podman in terms of the system D layer for uh, handling things like C groups, namespaces, et cetera. So um, without um, further ado, I will um, get my screen share going with the deck. Is this showing for everyone? Great. OK. Yes. So um, I don't know exactly how many people in this uh, meetup are familiar with um, the work that Pantheon does, but we're primarily focused on the Drupal and WordPress space for plat uh, as a platform for building, testing, deploying, and scaling those sites. Um, as part of operating that platform, we maintain a container grid um, sometimes counting into the millions of containers, the and orchestrate that across regions um, as far flung as uh, Canada, um, uh, the EU, Australia, um, and of course in the US. And we run that container platform in a way where we deploy these applications uh, to handle the web requests as well as um, provide the administrative facilities for things like running tools like Drush, WPCLI, Drupal Console, et cetera. As we continue evolving the platform, especially in a world where data sovereignty is becoming more and more important, um, data sovereignty being the concept of being able to keep data in a specific locale, it's becoming more important for us to find ways to leverage high-level cloud technology that allows us to deploy customer applications in the location of their choosing. And we're already using this technology for an early access product that we call front-end sites that's designed to run decoupled infrastructure, usually for tools like Next.js, uh, as well as static site generators such as Gatsby. But we are also looking uh, forward to deploying this sort of technology for the main parts of our infrastructure in terms of Drupal and WordPress. But we have to do that cautiously in the sense of managing control of the cost of that infrastructure, because it's not just about our bottom line and our expenses at Pantheon. It's also about the sort of features that we can support on the platform, because some of the features we offer, like multi-dev, where you can branch your code base and then build an entire stack around that branch, require us to maintain some control of the cost of that infrastructure. So for example, if we deployed a container uh, stack for, the, for every branch and kept them running all the time, we wouldn't be able to offer our products at the, at the prices we're able to offer them at. And we've been working with scale to zero technology for about 10 years now. Uh, really, I don't think we've ever run the platform that we've had without some degree of shutting down containers when they're not in use. Um, in fact, on our current platform, we deploy all of our containers uh, in a stopped configuration and wait for the first requests to come in before uh, setting them up in a way where they actually start and run the application. And that extends back to the database, um, back to um, 
uh, back to some other related resources. So what I've gone, what I've been working on um, the past six to eight months or so is in looking at the cost structures around using high level cloud technology where we can deploy containers directly. Um, hey, Peter. <laughs> oh, uh, I actually have the admit control. Um, oh, looks like, oh, I guess Sean took care of it. Okay. Um, so um, we're looking at ways to, um, to deploy these resources in effective ways where we can take advantage of running the containers only when um, the uh, when the application needs to run them and to have a good idea of the cost control around that. Um, I hope I'm not starting this too early because I was originally supposed to start at like 4.45 West Coast time. Um, but um, uh, Peter, is it okay that I'm like starting early? Sure, uh, we're okay. flexible. I don't, I don't, we didn't advertise the start time. So. Okay, I, w I, wasn't, I wasn't sure. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep going then. Um, so, we're modeling a lot of this um, in terms of the empirical data we have, which is an extensive amount of data because we we have logs of every single request hitting the edge of Pantheon's infrastructure. That's about 1% of page views on the internet. And we're able to take that data, digest it, look at what cache misses we're getting, look at when the containers are woken up, look at how long they're awake for handling the web requests, and look at how the concurrency is of requests going to a single site and turn that into um, cost models for various approaches we can take to resources and deployment models. And so um, this is basically an extremely simple but um, illustrative example of how um, request concurrency can play out for a single site and environment on the platform. What you're seeing here in terms of the magenta on this chart is this is kind of when a web request is active. Um, so they're arriving at different times, they take somewhat different durations, um, and they, um, of course, because of that, they're ending at different times. And the real question here is what kind of infrastructure do you deploy to be able to handle at scale this sort of um, arrival time and duration behavior that you see in these web requests? Um, it comes down to a question of like flexibility and cost with, with, with this infrastructure. We have all the way from the most traditional infrastructure where it's bare metal and you have a completely fixed deployment. It's, that is probably the cheapest infrastructure for the amount of resources you're getting, but you basically have almost no ability to vary those resources in the sense that um, when you deploy, say, a server at Rackspace, you might even be in a multi-year contract for that resource. And when you agree to expand the footprint of your resources, then you often have to have a similar commitment for additional resources you deploy. And, and of course, you have to keep in mind when you deploy them that you don't have the ability to, to change them on the fly. So you have to have resources that can meet your needs even when your traffic peaks. Like at, at Pantheon, for example, our peak traffic is during the middle of the day on Wednesday in North America. Uh, and that um, if we were deploying exclusively to something like say Rackspace, we would need to deploy all of our infrastructure in each region with the expectation of not even just the peak on a week to week basis, but we would need to be deploying resources for something like Black Friday most of the year, uh, which some of our customers have huge amounts of traffic on Black Friday, uh, or they might have huge amounts of traffic um, on New Year's or Valentine's Day or you name it. And we don't always have the ability to predict it. So a lot of organizations except for a very predictable resource uh, uh, um, resource planable workloads, like so, sort of like Dropbox storing their, the, the data on their systems, they've off, most people have moved away from deploying just bare metal. Um, so moving into the next level, um, which is also hard, uh, definitely not a, a newcomer at this point, is deploying virtual machines to a cloud, like something like EC2 um, or uh, Google Cloud, uh, uh, the compute on Google Cloud or Azure, or like honestly, almost every cloud offers the second one. Um, this is where you're deploying 
things that are you know virtual machines where you're still you still have an OS image uh, for a, typically a full OS, and those machines often take some time to provision. Sometimes it takes in the on the order of um, at least minutes. Um, often. In some cases, depending on the sort of orchestration you're using, tens of minutes to get one of these machines online. So you can change the deployment on a day-to-day -day or at most hour-to-hour -hour basis, but you, you really can't change it real time. Um, this allows some optimization, but it still is such a slow spin up that it requires a lot of prediction in order to manage dynamic provisioning in terms of, of like scaling and auto scaling. This is still the sort of system where you're gonna have to do warm up basically if you're expecting a lot of traffic. A lot of this also carries over into this next category, like container orchestration with something like Kubernetes. Um, typically this is deployed on top of virtual machines, but it has container infrastructure that is deployed in a way where not when you deploy a container, you're not deploying a host machine every time you're deploying a container. So this often means that you can have a bit more infrastructure at your disposal uh, that it can be more creatively and flexibly relied on for scaling up resources. This is often where a lot of organizations are at, at these days, where they're deploying something like Kubernetes that runs a container grid. Um, these containers are often Docker compatible, um, uh, just to like draw back on like one of the intro questions. But you typically still can't real-time scale this. Like um, you can often scale this a bit faster than the previous one in practice because a lot of, there are better tools for things like Kubernetes to be able to scale up clusters and get containers deployed, but you're still looking at scaling intervals that are measured in the minutes, which means you cannot deploy them completely real time. Finally, and, and like this is where a lot of our interest is, is going these days, is around serverless platforms, which is where you're not deploying the virtual machine at all. You have no access to the virtual machine. You typically get to supply either code or a container image, and then that typically deploys almost on demand. Sometimes you might have some minimum deployment uh, for it in order to reduce kind of like cold start times. I'll, I'll get into some of these details as, as I get into the different scenarios, but this is by far the most dynamic. It's also the most costly on a per second or minute basis. In fact, what you pay per, per minute for these resources is going up dramatically from the bottom of this to the top. Um, like the difference between virtual machines to serverless is often a, about a two to three X cost difference in, in the basic resources, but you don't really pay for those resources unless you're using them as you get into the serverless territory. So that creates a question. It's more expensive per, per second or minute or unit of time, but you only have to pay for it when you're using it. So what's cheaper? Um, it's a resource shaping exercise uh, ultimately with this um, in terms of what you expect the footprint of the resources to be corresponding to the actual workload of the system. Um, if you're familiar with calculus, we're basically doing something almost like integrals here. We're trying to find the area under the curve. And um, in this case, it's a little we're not just going for just the best fit of curve. We're trying to go for a curve that includes every bit of every request. Because if there are parts of requests that are outside the curve, then we have um, a problem. Because if if requests are, are bulging outside of the curve, it means we're starved for resources and we're getting downtime. So we're, we're really looking for the minimum curve that can actually fit the requests. So uh, I was starting off with like the Rackspace example, um, where you are, you're calling them up. Um, there, there was a customer I worked with before Pantheon where they had to fax in their orders for servers, uh, for the resources. Um, they were rather frustrated about that. But you, um, in these cases, you need to deploy the resources typically far in excess of what you expect to get on a typical day. And this is because even if this is showing a peak concurrency of four, typically the maximum concurrency you're gonna get on like, the worst 
or, or the, the, the heaviest load of the heaviest hour of the heaviest day of the year for yourself is often going to be a multiple of this. So you often have to over-provision quite a bit. Um, in many cases, you have to over-provision multiples of what your typical load would be. So what we're looking at here in a deployment scenario is for a very fixed workload, for a very fixed um, set of resources, you often have to deploy it far in excess. So I'm, I'm basically saying here, you're deploying um, something that's say two to three to, I don't know, even five X what you're actually using here. And you're keeping that constant. What you're paying for that yellow area per unit time is the lowest cost of all these options, but you're having to deploy it all the time. So often a lot of organizations have gotten away from this because if you have any power to shape your deployment in terms of virtual machines as you need it, then this is still actually quite expensive. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the cost modeling for this one, though, because this is not what Pantheon's doing right now. We're probably not going to be doing this. Um, it doesn't really suit our needs. There are a lot of sacrifices you make with this in the sense that uh, of of deploying the resources because you can't do it with an API anymore, uh, or at least you often can't. And you often don't have the power to deploy those resources in arbitrary zones and regions of the world as you need them. So there are lots of reasons this is off the table other than just the sheer cost. So um, let's look at um, a case where um, getting into more of the dynamic provisioning of resources. This is kind of more of a Kubernetes style auto scaling, where what, um, one of the ways that it's popular to auto scale with Kubernetes is that because you have a slow uh, time to adding additional containers that sometimes is measured in minutes, what you're dealing with is a situation where you want to pre-provision those containers. Uh, you want to have the capacity ready to go before you need it, not too far before you need it, but uh, you you want to be in the process of rolling out those additional containers before the, the load hits. Now, if the load comes too quickly, this is this is one of those cases where you might need to worm the cluster, like in terms of getting the additional stuff spun up. This is also a scaling model that some people use in serverless if the cold start times are, are, are too difficult. Now, I, I mentioned earlier, that I would kind of explain what I meant by cold start. A, a cold start time is typically something when you're when you're dealing with a system that can scale down, especially to zero. It's the time from needing the resources to being able to process the request. And so, in this case, they, um, for something like Kubernetes with auto scaling, you might have cold start times for containers that measure in the minutes. And so if, if your cold start times are not able to keep up with your needs, then you have to warm it up basically intentionally. This is some this has traditionally been the case with auto scaling in the cloud, especially years ago, where if you knew you were about to get your morning traffic, like let's say you provided a a business application to your customers, and you know that everyone was about to log into it that morning, you might warm up your stuff so that you have the capacity ready to go before users run into this. Because I can tell you here, um, can you actually see my mouse, by the way? Or I can do the annotation here. So what would be really bad is if you had a request come in, um, before the actual additional resources are spun up. There's like a lead time here, but if the next request arrived right here, this this may not be ready yet. Um, and so if, if the traffic comes in too quickly and you're not able to handle the cold starts quickly enough, you have to typically do this sort of provisioning. And what you end up with is a deployment model where you have extra capacity to provision. And, and if you look it up here, we have capacity that we're provisioning here that we never even have that we never even use. We're actually paying for this container up here for all of this space, even though it's never being used. Um, and this isn't great. Um, this is what I'd like to, what we're trying to avoid at Pantheon. We're trying to figure out ways to be more efficient with, with this scaling. So, um, oops, I am, whoops. Okay, so 
this is actually closer to like the model that we're looking at in terms of where we have um, containers that say could handle two requests at a time and we spin them up only on demand. Um, this means we have a bit of extra capacity whenever we have a container deployed before we can fill it up with requests, but we don't have all of that extra, um, all of that extra um, capacity. Uh, sorry, I'm new to the drawing tools on here. <laughs> um, all of that extra capacity up here, that goes away. We don't have all of this extra capacity here. That goes away. What you're actually seeing here is a substantial amount of savings versus having to have the, having to pre-provision containers because you have a cold start time. Now, um, this that last model is not totally accurate for what you can actually buy off the shelf, though, because. Realistically, we have other situations with how billing happens on these containers where we can't just completely tightly fit them to the um, to the resources that are needed in terms of like having them go away exactly when when we don't need them anymore. Realistically, a lot of these systems bill in certain intervals. And in the case of the system that we're building on for Pantheon with our, uh, with our current, say, front-end sites product and some of the future for our main runtime, there are 100 millisecond windows of, of how those resources get built, which means that as soon as you tick over, if you need 801 milliseconds of container, you actually have to pay for 900. So in order to build an actual cost model of what it looks like if we have fast cold starts and we have cost um, cost intervals of 100 milliseconds, then we have to actually build that into the model too, because we don't want to underestimate what, what is actually going to cost to run on this sort of infrastructure. Um, and also like from a perspective of building out a cost model and having it be something I could implement in a reasonable amount of time, I made a different compromise. Um, real, really, when uh, one of the containers starts on Cloud Run, Google starts the stopwatch on each one exactly when it starts. But in the case of working with data on the scale that Pantheon has with all of our edge data, it's extremely uh, it's extremely resource intensive to model every container at a full container level in terms of when those stopwatches start on a completely staggered basis. So what I started doing is working on a model that would overestimate the cost of basically deploying onto one of these serverless foundations like Cloud Run. And one of the ways I was able to simplify the model a lot was by having it set up where I assumed that containers could only start and stop on rounded intervals of time. So if you needed a container at 1500 seconds, like, um, whoops, let me use a thicker one here. If you needed a computer at 1500 seconds right here, I pulled it back to say the container had to start at, one, at 100 milliseconds in order to be available then. And if your container usage sticks over to just over say 700 milliseconds, I rounded up. So basically I put a floor on the start times and a ceiling on the end times for when the containers needed to be available. And what that meant is it creates a bit of an overestimate, which is okay. Um, we're trying to make good decisions here, not necessarily get information down to the cent. So um, when it comes to data modeling, um, there are lots of tools you can use out there. Uh, some people who are very far in the data space uh, like um, tools like R, but when it comes to working with pretty large amounts of data and given the kind of my familiarity with tool chains built around things like say Python, uh, I started rolling out pandas. Um, for people who are not familiar with pandas, it's almost like working with spreadsheet style data models directly in Python. In the sense that you have these things called data frames that almost work like spreadsheets. They have columns, they have rows. You can um, perform transformations across a column. You can um, set the like format of a column, but it, it's also like a spreadsheet in the sense that it doesn't, it, uh, it's like a spreadsheet more than a database in the sense that 
You can also have the data in a column vary in type uh, in the sense that a spreadsheet won't complain if one row has a date in, in column C and another row has a string, whereas a database just won't let you do that. So pandas in a lot of ways is sort of like a spreadsheet, but with tools to, um, to control some of the formats of the data and then analyze it in ways that, that pull in things like uh, data like log files, and then are able to produce aggregate data out of it. Uh, I started working with these tools back in 2020 when I assisted um, an organization in doing data modeling and supporting data science and epidemiology pro um, professionals uh, for COVID spread modeling, where basically we worked with organizations like the US Army, uh, Army Corps of Engineers to be able to help them plan things like field hospital deployments in order to understand where there might need to be extra bed capacity based on, based on the like local spread data. Um, and I'm glad I got exposed to those tools because I'm using them now for completely different purposes. So um, I'm not going to go into every line of the code because I don't, I'm guessing that like based on the makeup of this meetup, but probably it's not as heavy on, uh, on Python and especially not on pandas, but uh, I can explain it kind of as like a flow for the data. So when it comes to the data from our edge, we're, we're working with like, tens to hundreds of gigabytes of logs every ev for every 24 hour period. And that um, needs to all get rationalized in certain ways to be able to pump it into a model like this. Because the, the example I gave where there were like four different requests is an example for just like one site for one environment on the platform. Because one thing about containers on our platform is we can't use the same container to serve two different sites. Not only would that be unsafe, but like it just doesn't run the same code. So we have to basically run these container simulations simultaneously for every site on Pantheon for all of the traffic for, for a simulated period. And I, I went with a 24 hour period on Wednesday. Uh, I think the data I worked with here is from, um, from mid to late December uh, last year, because I, I wanted data that would be representative of a heavy load on the platform. Because again, I wanted to be kind of pessimistic with, with the simulation with Cloud Run, because it meant that we, if anything, we would overestimate what it would cost to run on it. So um, we took the log, I took the logs. Um, one of the things that I, our logs have is the logs are in a format where we have the arrival time of the request and we have the duration of the request. And the arrival time of the request is a timestamp and the duration is a number of milliseconds. This is not actually the kind of data that, that something like Pandas can easily work with because it's not actually start and end times or anything like that. So the very first step was converting the start and duration times into start and end date times in Pandas. The next thing um, that was that was just a very intermediate step, though, because the the real goal was to get them into a a data format that Pandas has called called date range, and date range is actually tracking beginning and ending ranges for times on a completely staggered basis. At this point, um, before looking at this frequency thing here. Uh, we're basically doing a, uh, we're, we're still maintaining complete fidelity to the ori original log data. Um, the, what the frequency thing does, thing does here is what I was showing here in terms of the, um, it is taking, it is doing the floor and ceiling on this to basically align these time windows with, with uh, this resampling interval. And what that means is that anything that needs to start, it's rounding all of the times for, for the start times of requests down and all the times for the completion times of requests up. And at this point, we have request data that is fully aligned with these 100 millisecond win windows in a sort of pessimistic way where we're with the floor and the ceiling. And that actually starts making it a little bit easier to stack the requests and look at concurrency. Um, and then the next step in the um, in the process was to explode the data. And what exploding here does is it's it's breaking up the request windows into chunks of data where rather than it just being 
all these different windows of time for these requests where they all start and end on pretty aligned things with because of this 100 millisecond resampling. The explode, what it does here is every request is basically now treated as a a contiguous set of 100 millisecond requests. And what, what this means is like, let's say a request lasts 300 milliseconds. It is now treated as, as if it is three different 100 millisecond requests that are just all um, back, um, back to back for each other. So um, what this means is now we have um, the data conceived of in a way where every request on the platform is is basically treated as a set of 100 millisecond requests that arrive at 100 millisecond aligned windows. And this starts making it much, much easier to be able to actually start um, determining how many requests need to go into a container. Um, at that point, we're grouping it by the service pool, which is the um, site and environment, which is basically the unique identity of the container, and um, and then dividing by the concurrency that containers can handle. And so what this means is that um, we're taking these sort of pretend 100 millisecond requests, looking at how many are stacked at any given window of time, these, these 100 discrete 100 millisecond windows, and then looking at how many are occurring simultaneously. So and this is with some rounding up as well. So if three requests are occur occurring simultaneously and a container can handle two, then that means we need two containers to handle those three requests. Um, more realistically, on, on actual deployed Pantheon, our concurrency for containers is closer to eight to 12 requests per container, which is still very small uh, in terms of how the industry works, but we try to keep it fine grained. Uh, what, but this, uh, this model allows us to tune all these things in a pretty nice way. So this produces some pretty interesting results. Like um, uh, this is, so assuming that we have four requests per container, a container memory of two gigabits, um, uh, gigabytes, sorry, um, which is basically two gigabytes. And we give um, 1.25 virtual CPUs that basically means that we can have a PHP memory limit of around 384 megabytes on average. This, some, some things will be above that and some things will be below on the platform. Um, and this is actually a pretty generous CPU allocation given that a lot of the time that PHP spends working, it's waiting on things like the database or Redis um, or pumping data out um, downstream. So, um, and then, then finally, this is also assuming something on Google Cloud called committed use discounts, which basically gives a about 20% off uh, if you're willing to basically commit to a given amount of usage overall for the product, uh, which like we have committed use discounts for the vast majority of our infrastructure at Pantheon because that's part of what we do with capacity planning. So this is very cool because like this means that like we could actually move to um, a model where we can deploy these application servers for um, for Drupal and WordPress running on a foundation that we could deploy to any zone or region in GCP. And there are 37 regions in GCP um, or an equivalent on something like Fargate on Amazon. There are 31 regions at Amazon right now. Um, and not have to deploy our own Kubernetes clusters or container runtime foundations for all of it. And we would only spend 4% more. Um, and this is without taking into account things like reduced amounts of overhead at the company for running things like the Kubernetes clusters and doing the capacity planning, et cetera. Now, this infrastructure is not modeled to handle things like Drush and cron jobs and stuff like that. So like this is, still not a complete model but it's it's close enough that like we could reasonably pick up this technology and be able to um, to move into quite a new generation of deployment on, on the cloud infrastructure um and so like i uh i'm happy to go back to any of these things like take questions um uh i know this is like some sort of like pretty detailed like modeling and and 
uh, and work on this. So like, uh, I'm happy to revisit any, any of the parts if I can help people um, grok like what's going through our heads here. Awesome, thanks so much, David. Anyone have questions? Curious for right now, what like what is your startup time for the containers on your current infrastructure? So um, our startup time for the containers on our current infrastructure for is different depending on the container type. Uh, for the PHP containers, the startup time until we're starting to run PHP FPM for a workload is usually about, uh, I want to say, one to two seconds at worst from, from cold. And by cold, I mean uh, where the container is like cold in, in these two different worlds is not exactly the same thing. Um, cold on our, our container optimized OS infrastructure is where we've deployed the container, but it's stopped. This is actually why we use run C instead of something like like um, the standard runtimes for containers, because it allows us to keep the socket open to listen. The request comes in, we start the container. And so like one to two seconds later, PHP FBM is starting to process the request. The primary delay then um, from there is probably doing things like repopulating the opt cache, which because that's, that's stored in memory. Um, and then, um, uh, depending on whether it needs to wake up the database container. Now, the database container, we only shut down if it's been inactive for quite a long time, I think almost 24 hours. Uh, and that takes often another three to five seconds to wake up if that's not running. Now, for a production site on the platform, the database container is almost always running. And uh, in many cases, at least some of the containers for the application servers are running. And that's, um, so typically when you reach a development site on Pantheon, like multi-dev, and you wait a few seconds for it to respond to your request, that's what's going on. It's actually starting the containers behind behind that environment. Um, but that, that's why we're able to offer things like multi-dev and, and allow you to have like five, 10 different environments on a site and not have to have it like, cost an arm and a leg. Um, the, the startup times on Cloud Run are quite different. Um, Cloud Run, uh, let me start with the coldest of cold starts. It does not actually um, keep around a deployed thing on disk and then wake up a container the way we do. It will deploy it real time, but it streams the container image to the machine. So it streams the container image, and then it starts to execute the container. That would still have a um, an unpopulated op, op cache for uh, for PHP, so you're still going to have that time. And then um, we're working on other optimizations in some of this space around the cold starts. I would I'm quite interested in finding a way, for example, to say persist the op cache in some way to disk and then like populate it into memory so that it doesn't have to be parsed um, as the container starts. Um, and then um, what Cloud Run has is another thing that we don't really have on the current platform, or maybe we're somewhere between cold and warm. But when a container hasn't has not been active for um, a brief period of time, like up to 15 minutes on Cloud Run, what happens is, is it clamps the CPU down to almost nothing, but it keeps the container in the memory. So you actually keep the op cache around for PHP. And the container wakes up and starts serving the request just by basically unclamping the CPU. Uh, in practice, we find that this is often able to do warm starts uh, for the vast majority of cases based on traffic patterns on the platform. So it's actually a lot more common to have a warm start than a cold one from, from the simulations we've done. And we are not really able to distinguish the latency between warm start and hot in the sense that it is so fast to unclamp the CPU and start processing a request when the op cache is already populated, the file system is already mounted, um, the container is already deployed and in memory, that it basically may as well be a hot start for the purpose of a web application. Um, so I, I hope that kind of answers your question around like the timing for that stuff. Yeah, that is interesting. Uh, I mean, I think one of the other things that's interesting to think about for containers and yeah i know uh i mean i think php does have the ability right to repopulate the opcache off 
disk. And given that a given container image is a fixed set of code, right, it shouldn't be different op caches anytime it runs. Does it, so I know, I, I believe it M maps it. I wasn't sure if it could actually work with a real file. Um, I haven't, it's been mm. a couple of years since I've dug into the runtime to, to evaluate that though. Um, the fact that I believe it uses mmap for allocating the memory though for it means that we could probably persist it to disk or populate it or pre-populate it in a sense in a way that would be pretty easy from a surger surgery perspective of PHP FPM. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been a while since I've looked at it too, but I I felt like that was definitely a facility it had. Uh, and then your containers... I'll are running just FPM, like the FPM is the only thing in that container? We have different models right now. Um, yeah. We have the like the like slim and fat containers. Um, mm -hmm. So the slim containers are what we have deployed to our main infrastructure for the runtime. That has PHP FPM in one container, I think Nginx in another container, the file system in another container, and I think like the new Relic agent in yet another container. Okay. What, um, we're actually looking at moving um, more back to fat container model, which is what we had historically. A fat container consolidates a lot of these into one container image rather than a sort of pod in the kind of like Kubernetes sense. Right. The um, part of why we're moving back to that in some ways, at least for some reasons, is that for our job running infrastructure, a lot of the stuff we're doing on that is with Google Cloud built, which um, we're we're um, just about to roll, we're using it actually for a lot of internal jobs right now, but we're about to work on rolling it out more to some customer accessible job systems. And what that means is we have to have a way to do everything in the cloud build container. That means like having PHP, PHP CLI in that case run, the file system mounted and any other agents that we need to run. And so that's set up as a fat container again. And then it's, very likely that whatever we do with Cloud Run, we will be able to we we will probably do it on the basis of what we've done with Cloud Build, on the uh, because it it has like an immutable container model, in a single container, and that makes it a little easier to put it onto Cloud Run, like basically by attaching a web server and PHP FPM in front of what we're using for the job runner. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, because I feel like some of my colleagues, you know, feel like there should be a push to sort of single service containers, but I'm, I'm not sure that the complexity of that makes sense in, in every case. It, it can be nice for yeah. some security basis, uh, although I don't, I don't know, like, mm -hmm. I don't actually think that the, that there's a very meaningful security boundary between some of these in the sense that like, um, if you like the most, the first attack surface that most attackers are going to get to is basically the web application itself. And if your web application talking to your database and these other things is not the key thing that you're compromising, um, then I'm not sure what else the, the attacker is compromising. Like, and it, like that needs to be isolated from everything else. But um, I don't think there are very many cases where compromising the web server is a bigger risk than compromising, you know, access to the database. Like the once you get to the PII or the other like crown jewels in the database, like it's kind of game over. So it's uh, I tend to like to work from it from a threat modeling perspective rather than just a completely maximum isolation perspective. Sure. And yeah, uh, I mean, I'm curious about your success using uh, containers for the database. Um, I feel like that's still something that's seems a little scary to do in terms of um, you know, the data persistence and stability. Well, our our existing platform, like our, our main platform right now with um, the databases, that's all deployed to container optimized OS stuff running on run C. And then we're using um, cloud block devices to back the data for that. So it's, it's not a particularly exotic uh, deployment model that we're using for those DBs. We're not sure what DB deployment model we're going to use going forward. I actually have some conversations coming up with with um, with Google to like kind of like scheme on some of this in the sense of like um, 
I like I can't go into roadmap details of stuff, but like it's um like we're always having conversations around the right way to handle this because I would like to see more of this stuff scale to zero. Um, like we already have our databases scale to zero for these development environments on our on our core platform right now. And I don't want to lose that. Like that's a that's a powerful capability. Um we've done a lot of cool things to even make it work well. Like um we have we have say like MariaDB and MySQL shut down in a way where we tie up all the loose ends when we're shutting the database down so that when it starts up, it doesn't need to do anything like um like trawl through the commit log, for example. Mm -hmm. So like that, like there are lots of things you can do when shutting down the database to minimize the startup time when you actually need it again. Hmm. That's interesting. Is that is that something that's standard in those or you you had to add it's that? standard. It's just like there are um it's it's standard in the sense that it's implemented as part of Maria and MySQL. It's just that you have to configure some of it to be a little more aggressive on shutdown. Like you basically can configure it to do a little more housekeeping on shutdown. Whereas like the default shutdown method is a little bit more about like shutting down quickly and almost like um, crash oriented kind of design where like if, it, if it's been committed to the commit log and that's been committed to disk and synced to disk, then like, do you really need to like make sure that that gets integrated into your inner DB files on shutdown. Like, I mean, in mo many cases, no, but like if you want the database to start up as quickly as possible, as soon as you're right. like needed again, then you actually want that kind of housekeeping done. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not about whether the data is, is durable or not. It's about like how it's, um, how it's been arranged um, to make the startup faster or slower. Right. Uh, well, it, yeah, that's it also, neck, yeah. It's also like a thing where like we configure some of these aspects to be smaller than a typical configuration would have for things like the commit log because it allows us to put better bounds on like the worst possible scenario for startup time. Right. Okay. I assume those are not replicated, right? They're just single database instances. I believe once we have replication for one of these databases, we no longer treat the um, the replica set as eligible for shutdown. So um, we do offer database replication for high availability, but that's primarily in higher end sites and plans. And it's typically mostly exclusive to the live environment, maybe the test environment. And, right. and then so we're still able to hibernate the other environments like for multi-dev, but we okay. don't like it's it's too we 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 decided it was too complicated and not worth the effort to try and um and shut down like scale to zero when you have replication. Right. Yeah, that sounds like a headache. Yeah, it's uh, the way that replica replication works for like leaders and followers and stuff like that for, for MySQL and Maria is not, um, it's certainly not designed for having at least the leader database um, be shut down on an opportunistic basis. Right. I mean, you think you could shut down the follower, but then you don't really have hot tail over. So. Yeah, you don't have, yeah, you lose the HA. So it's like, at what like if you're allowed like you would have to do something where you could run the leader and you shut down the follower until you have rights and then you walk and then you like wake up the follower to like replicate those rights so like if it, it gets very complicated very fast and like the cost savings are just not there because it represents a relatively small fraction of the overall databases deployed on the infrastructure because the vast majority of databases deployed to our in infrastructure are for pre-production purposes, not for production. Right. Because hmm. like every site on the platform gets at least three environments right. and some of them have more than 10. Um, hmm. And every every environment but one for those sites is, is pre-production. Mm -hmm. Right.
So one interesting point you bring up is that some are more than 10, um, that some of those are me. <laughs> um, like, what is the what is the cost benefit if you were like to say, like, you know, you only get three extra multi devs besides the standard three? Like, is there a big cost savings? Or is there no cost, like arbitrary cost savings across the board if you were to kind of decrease that or change the plan level or something like that as you look at these Ooh. like cost cost analysis? Um, we mostly treat um, we mostly treat access to multi dev environments as something that is treated as like a premium feature for the sake of teams that are larger. Like in the sense that generally you really need more of those environments when you have more people working on the site. And then we try try to treat the number of like since we don't charge for the seat for the number of people you have accessing the site. We treat the number of multi-dev environments you get access to as one way for us to like roughly scope things like how much support we're gonna have to provide you. Uh, in the sense that if you need a bunch of multi-dev environments, you're probably not just one developer. And it probably means that you have more, so it probably means you have more than one developer, which means that we probably have, we're probably gonna have more support challenges and you probably have more needs for complexity for the site. And so we just treat it as as one way to um, to manage that sort of um, cost and offering. And and like so, there are some sites that have more than ten. Uh, for the vast majority of sites, we cap them at ten, even if you upgrade to a plan that has multi dev, because really ten is like quite a bit of things in flight. And like the whole the, the philosophy around multi dev is that like. You're not really supposed to just keep them around forever. It's more like these are extra QA environments or feature branches or or sandbox environments for individual developers or like concurrent things you're working on for the site. Um, so like in some ways, it also like forces users to do some housekeeping on that rather than just leaving them around because even if we shut the database down, it's still deployed somewhere. We still have it running. We still have it on a machine ready to wake up with sitting on block storage. We still keep the, uh, and we still keep the other resources around, but the database is actually one of the primary costs on an environment by environment level for, uh, for the, um, for why we like control multi-dev. Okay, cool. Thanks. There we are, Sean. How how many uh, of those sites you keep around? Uh, I have too many <laughs> <laughs> to save some money. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like those things that go stale. It's like there's a feature request, and then it's like you know goes to the bottom of the of the list, and then it sits there to rot. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, we um, we still. I mean, we don't have a cap on the number of branches you can have. Right. And, like, right, get, right, right. Get so like the, part of the idea is that. Honestly, if, if something's going to be shelved for long enough, then we'd probably recommend shutting down the multi-dev environment mm -hmm. and keep the code around. Right. Dump the and database. If, yeah. 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 Because if you're gonna, if it's gonna go that stale, you probably don't want to resume the work on such stale data anyway, because mm -hmm. you're still looking at a feature that you're ultimately gonna have to deploy to your production yep. system. And some of the biggest failures you get in Drupal is are things around, say, schema updates, where like it's not actually tested against the production, the latest production data, um, or other assumptions about um, what you're deploying on top of. And so, yep. in some ways, we're sort of forcing you to rebase in the Git sense uh, on top of data that's actually representative of production. And you can only really keep that, you can only really juggle that many, th so many things at once that are constantly getting rebased that way in a way that are being sort of on the, on the sort of taxi way to take off for production. Mm -hmm. yep. Cool, any other questions? What kind of um, environments do you offer for little guys? Uh, clearly, all this stuff is for large uh, deployments and uh, big commercial environments. We have exactly the same stuff, no matter, even if you come in and set up a basic site. Um, the uh, the most basic sites don't come with multi-dev, but they still come with dev, test, and live in the sense that you still have... Um, a staging environment for for doing dry run deployments and a development environment that is um, 
that you can basically be working on the code either real time on the server or pushing up code as often as you want. And all of those are tied in with the complete stack in the sense that all of them have the CDN integrated with them. All of them have their own database and file system. Uh, depending on the plan you're on, they might also have their own Redis and Solar. Um, so it's actually pretty accessible. Um, we try to keep quite a few, quite a bit of the platform available even for entry level use because we know that the developers who ultimately do the big projects have to start somewhere. And uh, you can get, uh, and even the things like multi-dev are possible to get through self-service plans in the sense of you don't have to like call our sales team or anything, uh, depending on the needs for a project. Well, I guess uh, I'm, I'm thinking my my own environment. I mean, I have got dinky little sites that get virtually no traffic, and um, but it, it seems like from what I've seen, the pricing on Pantheon for those kinds of sites is just not affordable. Um, for yeah, it, there is a certain point at which it's which like we're we're not necessarily targeting the same market as say shared hosting providers, in the sense of there are there's a certain point at which we stop trying to do cost control and try to keep everything um, consistent across the platform. Like in in the sense of, for example, I mentioned every one of these environments has access to a CDN. Every single request on the platform goes through an integrated CDN built on right now, like it's currently built on Fastly, um, and that um, means that stuff is cached all over the world. It's, it, it's optimized on the request path back through a uh, an origin shield. And then that is gives it another chance to hit the cache before going back to the origin. And we have things even integrated to the point where you can save content in Drupal with our plugins or our module, and it will invalidate it across the world on, on the cache. Uh, and so some of these capabilities are just not that affordable for us to offer for the completely entry market uh, for, for really small sites. So uh, there, there are some things where we've had to make some compromises in the sense of what we can address as a market, because it's a lot of work actually for us to say, introduce a product that doesn't have those capabilities. Uh, and, and we've focused a lot of our effort on the, mar the parts of the market that need those capabilities. So Steven, you bring up a good point because like we talked probably a year plus ago about this thing called Tome, which is like um, Sam Mortensen's like uh, static site generator for Drupal. Right. And like that's a way of getting your Drupal site, which doesn't change that often to like you basically, you know, render it out as a static site. And so like, uh, David, like how is that front end sites different in terms of like, if I don't need a Drupal and I don't need a WordPress, what does that, what does that mean for that? Like more, let's call it entry level or static firsty kind of site. Just to be completely honest, I don't, we're not really targeting the entry level market right. there either. Right. Uh, in yeah. the sense that, um, that it's, we're primarily targeting cases where it's built off a content management system. Even if you use a static site generator, mm -hmm. we're generally expecting that you're generating it from a content management system like okay. Drupal or WordPress. And um, it still gets into kind of our investment in capabilities that uh, are targeted at that, at that like That's mid to upper niche. market. Yeah. Um, Cause like it's all still CDN integrated. Mm -hmm. It's all still, um, tied in with capabilities for things like single sign-on and enterprise permissions. And um, I, I um, honestly, I would pick up GitHub pages if you really want this yeah. simple use case, like drop your markdown files in. Um, I, it, GitHub pages was originally built by Drupal alumnus, um, Sam Kotler. So like uh, um, <laughs> you, you even get to like, still have that like Drupal universe goodness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um yeah it so works like, it works great yeah i mean we're deploying a like production site for a local you know kind of organization and on github pages like you build a static mm -hmm. thing with you know your content and it actually like it's pulling some data right now from contentful uh which but it was silly because the data rarely ever changes we basically build 100 percent static and it'd be even faster um you know and just build it when the data changes and put it 
yeah, we put it on GitHub pages. We have a, you know, GitHub Actions to build a site. So mm -hmm. um, it's all like, you know, you don't need you don't need fancy hosting for that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I mentioned earlier that uh, I I work on some. I'm like a maintainer for some projects related to the core container layers on Linux, and the um, I also help out with our annual conference and our annual conference, all systems go, we run that on GitHub pages. <laughs> like, cause it's just other, like the conference paper management stuff doesn't run on that site. It runs on its own like product. And the actual site for the conference has like three pages, like it, and we update the dates and, and like the venue information every year. Like, <laughs> so, um, like the right tool for the job every time, like, um, I, is, is definitely where I'm at for that. And what is the, when you mentioned, you keep mentioning a container optimized OS, is that yeah. like a flavor of Linux that you that's, gotta that's, use? Um, yeah, that, that's that's a Google thing. Um, it's it's open, it's fully open source, but it's, it's basically built on some of the same foundations as Chrome OS, and it has some of the same designs as the old version of Core OS. And by old version of Core OS, I mean the version before Red Hat took over it. The new version is very interesting too, but runs on very different technology. Uh, and so it it's an immutable OS where it has like an A and B partition for the bootloader. So when you update a node, you basically can update the the inactive one and bounce it into the um, the newer um, base OS. This is also how my desktop runs, although on, on the Red Hat tech. Um, and then it's optimized purely around running containers. Like you can, it's actually very hard to put things in the base system. There are certain container formats you can use on it that are a little closer to deploying on the base system. And we use those for some of the like monitoring and management tooling. But we run the vast majority of our platform on that at this point, which means like a kernel update updates the inactive partition and then we bounce all the nodes. And so like, you don't have to wait on an, um, it's not updating the system in place, which is safer. Uh, the running system is immutable, which is also safer. Uh, and the um, if there are problems, you can even revert. Like you can even re reboot back back into the the old partition. Um, so it's it's also very easy to roll back to a known good state. Right. Okay. I remember I was talking about this. Yeah. In the uh, inspiration, some of the original inspirations for the Drupal auto updates. Um, so I guess that's now shifted to a, a different, slightly different strategy. Um, Yep, um, but that's this is what it was based on. Um, the yeah. uh, it was based it was really based on um, the original original implementations of this stuff. Um, yeah, which was uh, like the core OS and like even core OS was based on what Chrome OS was doing. So like actually it comes right back to Google. Chrome OS uses <laughs> dual dual partitions, which itself is like you could trace that design to like I don't know that Google was inspired by it, but like. The same design is on almost every Cisco device that's shipped in the last few decades, where like yeah. you update the firmware, you're not updating the live firmware, you're updating like the B A or B image, and then you bounce the switcher router, and then it's now on on the other one. Yeah, it's the future of all almost all computing, I believe. Like, um, whether it's based on an A B thing or based on a sort of um, tree structure of images like my desktop is based on with o lib os tree but like you update the inactive stuff and you bounce and like it's okay. so much more predictable from a, a systems management perspective hmm. it's also popular in some of the iot space because like one of the biggest challenges with um with embedded devices is like updating them and not having them break because they're not like hooked up to to monitors and keyboards like how do you unbreak something so like the right. answer is often don't break it right <laughs> or at well, least we're unfortunately... be able to recover from breaking right well unfortunately yeah the previous answer was don't ever update it so it's a horribly insecure clue mm -hmm. right? <laughs> yeah
Um, so, so the short answer, so it sounds like you're moving to uh, this kind of serverless model, or or is that just still under consideration at this point? I think we're we're adopting it as part of our mix. Hmm. Uh, I don't know that we're ever going to completely abandon running um, our own um, like orchestrated clusters or containers for some resources. Like putting databases on Cloud Run is like it, 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 inadvisable. Uh, like yeah, even though you can sure. set the maximum number of containers on Cloud Run to one, it doesn't actually guarantee that that is not briefly violated. It guarantees you will never be billed for more than one one at max, <laughs> but it may briefly deploy two because like they don't move containers between machines and the way that they provide availability and continuity is basically by like deploying another one and then shutting down the first one. So like they yeah. want, they actually try to have some overlap as far as I understand. So like, it's not great for that use case. Uh, right. So we might need to run, and also Cloud Run can only handle HTTP traffic and pub mm -hmm. sub events for like event arc. That said, we have tunneled SSH to Cloud Run over web sockets for the sake of running Drush. Like we mm -hmm. had a successful experiment with that last year. Um, so that basically you could use a thing that wrapped the tunnel on the client side and then connected it with web sockets up to Cloud Run. And that, that method um, for the experiment allowed us to have up to one hour of interactive session for, for like Drush. Hmm. Okay. With, with a with a like scale to zero backend. Right. Hmm. Yeah, I was gonna say, because it would seem like yeah, those interactive sessions would be sort of the hard part to support on those on that kind of platform. But you'd still then have to have the database in a more standard container. The this was this experiment was still with the database being like in a in a more standard deployment. Right. Okay. And I guess you guys are are not still using your Cassandra based file system. Is that is that we are? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> no, we still use Valhalla for everything. Um, right. Okay. Uh, and like that, like the way we got around that like issue around like how do you handle like it being deployed in containers and stuff is we designed the entire system from the basic assumption of like, we do not have like a sort of, um, a, a sort of locking and single point of truth model that is it, like the system is actually um, all built around around the idea that like you would you cannot run a database or like get on top of Valhalla. Mm -hmm. It is it is not possible to have that at least work. We have had at least one customer try. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were running, they were trying to run Git on Valhalla to track like an ETL workload for like moving data from one system to another. Mm -hmm. And so they were trying to like commit like the last data that they had gotten so that they could compare with a diff thing. And that was just mm. a mess. Like, cause mm. like we don't, we don't have any locking on there and different nodes running it. Like we just take the last right <laughs> to a given file. So right. like that was, that was, that particular use was a disaster. And we, and we don't promise that that can work. And mm. we almost, we almost never have people try that. So like, and that was, that was like five years ago that I think I saw someone try that. Uh, the last time someone tried to run a workload that you just couldn't run on it. Um, but like, yeah, the database still really is like the last thing there that is like very challenging from a perspective of like, it needs to have complete read after write consistency for at least the leader instance. And uh, it needs to um, have all sorts of like file locking and other stuff. So like, we'll see where that goes. Yeah. We might we might still be deploying kube clusters of databases like five years from now. Yeah. And by the way, uh, kube and container container optimized OS they're very friendly with each other. Like yeah. most deployments of container optimized OS are orchestrated using Kubernetes. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say though, I, I feel like Valhalla is what like ten years old or something now. Yeah. When did you? Deploy that, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, it's all it's all uh it doesn't run on Python anymore though. It's mm -hmm. all it's all been rewritten to go. Okay. But still the same mm -hmm. underlying, like Cassandra backing it. Yep.
any particular reason that Pantheon is is Google based versus AWS? Like, what's what's the is there like a a positive upside there? Is it just a you know decision? Like, I mean, Google's products are way better than AWS's interface probably will ever be. But <laughs> hey, um, so I'll answer both for then and now. Um, for then, when we were making the decision, it was largely about having uh, access to a really um, coherent story around Kubernetes in terms of GKE was in its early GA as a product. Whereas Amazon was still doing their weird Amazon container products. And like the one, I think it still exists as a product, but like it's it's neither completely serverless nor is it like standard Kubernetes. It's like kind of the worst of both of those worlds. <laughs> um, Azure at the time had an excellent Kubernetes story. Like they were doing some very interesting things with Kubernetes. Like they clearly understood it, but the performance of it was really weirdly slow. Like provisioning additional nodes and managing containers through their Kubernetes implementation had like, was like, something like 10 to 20 times slower than it was in Google for a lot of the, the key operations mm -hmm. at the time. Keep in mind, this was like five years ago. Uh, a lot of this is no longer true. Um, like Amazon has a Kubernetes product now that is that is totally decent. Um, Azure has shortly improved the performance of their stuff. Uh, but now uh, my interest is less around Kubernetes and more around serverless containers and workloads. And I actually think Google is still leading on a lot of that stuff. Uh, at least for the for the uh, main container runtimes, Cloud Run is like really really good. Like with one like one hundred millisecond windows of time, not like second level. I now my comparison with the, I think the closest product on AWS is Fargate, uh, and I'm not totally up to date on that, but I don't know that it's hundred millisecond intervals. Um, I don't know that it's nearly as good at scaling to zero in the sense of like, I don't know if that's actually a feature. And even if it is a feature, I don't know that the cold start times are nearly as good. Where like Google is allowing you to scale to nothing and then streaming a container out to a machine like as soon as a request comes in. So as long as your application can start up quickly, you can get a fast cold start on Google. Um, and I know Azure has a product in that space, but I'm not. I, I'm not. I'm even less familiar with it than Fargate. Um, so uh, I would say then and now um, we're very happy with where we're at. Uh, I would also say that like a lot of the big data products in Google are, I think, better and more mature than they are on AWS. And like when I was mentioning this log analysis and stuff we do, we pump 100% of our logs for for not just cache misses but cache hits too into BigQuery. And um, unlike on some of the Amazon stuff, like we don't have to do any capacity planning with Google. We just pump the data into BigQuery. We pay by the number of gigabytes that we have persisted. And we pay by the number of gigabytes that we have it trawl through for querying. Hmm. And, and so as long as we keep our cost models in order for that, in terms of like the copies of the data we store and how we query it, we're great. Like we don't have to revisit that at all. Like as our traffic goes up, um, we just pump more and more data into it and it works. And so like, that's a, that feels to me more like real cloud than mm -hmm. at least the products that, that Amazon had at the time, like five years ago, at least the, the best big data products you could get out of Amazon were basically like, they would deploy Hadoop to you for a cluster. And then like, you could tell them how many nodes you wanted. And then as you ne needed more data, like you could tell them to add more nodes. Mm -hmm. And like, that's like, that doesn't feel very cloud to me. Like right. cloud to me is like, I want to deploy this stuff out there and pay and like, just have it run and scale. Right. Cool. Thank you for answering Is that, that the platform you <laughs> use for, yeah. Do you use that platform for like any kind of instant detection or analysis, or do you have something else that's more real time for the, for that it's, use case? It's shockingly real time. Like, uh, yeah. like I, I, I believe I'm usually able to query the logs in BigQuery less than 30 seconds after they get added. Hmm. So we don't and, have any. Do, does, 
you don't have anything else for log. We don't log have data. anything else designed to provide a faster path to those analytics because we haven't needed it. Okay. Interesting. Even when I'm debugging something for a like customer. <laughs> it's fast enough. Yeah, like. But um, yeah, I think. 30 seconds. Like, I know we're spending like. Yeah, because I know we spent like a, a ton of effort like trying to figure out like what kind of like effective centralized logging could we implement, you know, and yeah, if there was a, something simpler where we could just pump it in there. We also, you know, promise our customers sometimes that we're not going to put their data in the cloud. So yeah, that's, 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 a, that's I mean, a different issue. <laughs> of course, our, our customers are intrinsically having their data like um, on Google infrastructure because we use Google. Right. So like using that for the logs has not really introducing any data. Like Google has access to no more information about our customers' data because we store logs there than if we didn't. Uh, like they right. would still be running the runtime that actually accepts the requests. Right. I guess we should dig into that because I'm not sure that logs count as customer data, right? Uh, it's not like they're actual internal It, it depends on, data. on what like is in them. Um, right. Like in our case, the vast majority of logs are not like PII insensitive. Like we're not logging session I session tokens in the logs or anything like that. Right. And presumably you're not logging the post data, right? You're just logging the, the path and maybe probably not even the headers, right? We do not log all the headers. There are some headers we extract for the logs. Like okay. we have the we have the host header, we have the user agent. Um mm -hmm. uh yeah. There are a handful of other ones that we that we keep. Like we keep sure. some of the headers indicating things like cache hit miss, where it hit the cache. Right. Um, but it's almost all for analytics. Yeah. So yeah, that's pretty safe. But then I guess do you also log, log like PHP errors or other kind of more system level things into the same place? No. Um, yeah. right now, well, I mean, we should probably change that, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> right now PHP errors get pushed to two different places. If you have a new relic enabled, it'll get pushed there because of course the new relic agent captures errors. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we also have a PHP extension that pumps the errors into our core API for the error listing that you see in the dashboard. And so mm -hmm. that's just stored in, in our core API. Uh, we're trying to migrate that out of there for scaling scaling reasons because like that that's like actually one of the busier things using up our API storage resources. Mm -hmm. So that I, I'm not sure where we're planning on putting that yet. I'm guessing probably not BigQuery though, because like mm -hmm. the BigQuery querying model for that stuff is actually not ideal. Not okay. just because not because of the latency. But because like if we pump all customer data into these things, you have to come up with a partitioning model for some of it. Maybe we could come up with the right partitioning model, but like the, the price for querying data in BigQuery is based on how much data that Google has to go through to prepare the results for the query. So sure. um, like I can never query less than say like an hour, like when I'm querying our edge logs, I can never query less than say like an hour of all of our edge logs because it's like partitioned mm -hmm. by time. So okay. um, like I can't run a query on our edge logs without it costing at least somewhere more than a dollar. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to do it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> right. I guess because I guess it would the request that we're causing it. Yeah, we would want to. Um, we would want to have a model where customers can access their their error stuff as uh, frequently as they want to refresh it. And we potentially would want to be a little bit more real time than that. Um, we, we do have um, like for our front end sites products, when you're doing builds and stuff, you can actually um, tail the logs real time as they're getting generated mm -hmm. as well as pull up the, the historical ones. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to probably try and move more in that direction. Well, sounds good. All right. Well, thank you again, David, for uh, this, uh, David, this has been makeup a... slash <laughs> <laughs> extra <laughs> uh, presentation. Yeah. Thanks. This fun. Yeah. Well.
not as good as having you in person, but oh, <laughs> I'm, I'll 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 try and make it out again. Like, um, <clears throat> I'll be in New York this summer. Okay. So like, I I might be able to pop down to Princeton or something. We'll yeah. see. All right. All right. We'll see if we're back in person ever. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, several years ago we did a you know Jersey Shore uh, event, so you know, I'll let you know. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll work on my like um, my like Jersey Shore like beach body like before yeah. heading out. <laughs> right. You don't uh, have you to work that hard. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, very good. Um, does anyone have another topic or discussion point? We got about twenty minutes left in our time here together. I, I I know I was asked the question like go first or go go other thing. Is there another thing lined up? Not necessarily. It's just discussion. Q and A. Oh, okay. Show off your show off your stuff. Wing it. Yeah, sort of like I... <laughs> yeah, I have one question. Uh, yeah, go for it. Okay. Go for it, Steve. Go for it, Steve. Um, there seems to be a bug either. In, I guess in the uh, latest um, ten. Drupal 10 installer that it uh, says that it can run uh, it needs PHP uh, um, 8.1 8 or greater but the greater if you run to 8.2 it, it won't install hmm. I had a downgrade to 8.1 that's surprising maybe check like Drupal core issues because that um, I did not. Like I, I just it just happened yeah. uh, like in the past two days, and I haven't had time to really uh, dig further. But I um, ended up just uh, enabling eight one and tried it, and it worked fine. But uh, eight two, eight two five, or whatever it is, is the latest uh, on that server I just built. So this is mm -hmm. how I'm uh, finding this out. So I, I just built a multi-site uh, Apache server. And um, been installing uh, some test sites, and it, it just uh, refuses to, uh, to to run. So uh, I guess um, I'll have to try to do some digging. Um, if if that is an issue, I don't know what's documentation issue or whether it's just code. But it seems in multiple places, I believe it says uh, it should be able to. Uh, um, it re says. Eight one or greater, so therefore any eight should mm -hmm. work. I would think. And you said this yeah, is Drupal I'm... ten, right? Yes. No, I'm I'm looking at a page right now. I'll put it in the chat. Eight point two ten point x. So yeah, I wonder. Hmm. Let's see where's the chat now. I mean, there's there is like a core issue, yeah, that was fixed. Um, yeah, several months ago. Now this is a new uh, yeah. composer install, so it's uh, it pulled the hmm. la latest. Weird. Hmm. And you were do you, this is the like, like interactive installer, or are you using like a command line installer? Uh, interactive. I don't know. I, I, I thought there were even some tests for the interactive installer, but I could be wrong. So, it yeah, it, it just clearly wouldn't budge <laughs> until yeah. I went down at eight one, and then it, it just installed fine with eight one. After you installed yeah. it to eight one, could you upgrade it to eight two without issue? Did not try that yet because, like I said, I just barely got this uh, server, the mm -hmm. Apache server, built uh, like three days ago, and then I. Then try to start doing the uh, site installs mm -hmm. for because I'm trying to put all my test sites uh, to have my local development system, and uh, that's um, just like I said, it refused to go. <laughs> then I had to go figure out how to reset the, the default uh, PHP. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, you know, uh, version mm -hmm. 
And uh, so once I figured that out, then, you know, because I'm learning all this, trying to do all this stuff command line, you know, it, yeah. as it's a real server, not, you know. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll dig a little further. I just wasn't sure where to even um, report that because I wasn't sure whether <laughs> it's an installer issue or a core issue. Hmm. And you're what, what, uh, what, um, thing were you installing? Standard, minimal, or profile? Um, standard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the version of support page claims that PHP 2 is should work on Drupal 10 0, 0, So, and this was Drupal's own installer, or are you using some kind of hosting platforms? Installer? No, it's my own physical Ubuntu. <laughs> uh box i have a box downstairs i put right. installed and... you you put to 2004 um you know put in um my sql uh php uh php my c right. uh, my admin and uh created a whole directory structure configured apache for multi-site uh ssi and uh did the whole the whole deal so uh and then ran composer and sold composer um and then did the composer install and then went to the interactive to for the configuration and that's where it uh, hung up and until <laughs> i set the default uh php at, at the command line uh on the server uh it would not continue hmm. well yeah i don't have an easy answer because it looks like it <laughs> should work but yeah you some people were saying they need to turn off certain deprecation notices or other things that may depend on, but you were just installing core itself and not any modules. Right. Just core. Yeah. 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 I mean, so, you know, no, nothing fancy here. <laughs> it's just, I yeah. couldn't get past, uh, you know, couldn't get past that. Okay. I had a, a you know, the only other, it did flip a couple other warnings, but I had to go fix them um, with, um, um yeah try to remember exactly what it was yeah. but the main the main hang up was i couldn't get past the uh php version hmm. yeah hmm. no no easy answer there but eight one worked fine so i mean you know it's okay. like everything yeah. else works and everything else of the system works and it, I, I i brought up a, a umami uh demo mm -hmm. site and uh, that were just just ran fine if well, I, I don't know. document yeah. that where should i uh, communicate that yeah i was looking yeah for any kind of outstanding core issue i think i would uh um you know, clearly it's like being able to replicate it and you know, maybe checking the PHP log for any kind of errors as you go. I don't know if, if you saw anything like the PHP error log or make sure that the PHP error logging is enabled. I um, did not. I'll have to we'll go back to that. Yeah. Well, where do, where do I uh, enable that? If you can refresh my... I mean, it's the PHP I and I... There is All like right. a, you know, any setting for error log where you can set like a location or you could send it to syslog. I think. All right. I uh, would imagine whatever the default install, whatever, if that leaves it on, it should be there. Um, I don't think it's on by default in, in, a, lot of, in a lot of cases. All right. Especially. I can go to the any &E and uh, turn it on. Yeah. So I'd look at that before you, yeah, make sure that works before you start. And then at least if there is like a, you know, glaring PHP error, it would show up. Okay. Um, yeah, but it, it doesn't seem like it should. No, I mean, if eight <laughs> one works, then you know it doesn't make sense that eight eight two five wouldn't. Yeah, you wouldn't think, but again, yeah. Yeah, I get it. I get it. You know, we changing. I have to walk it. <laughs> have to walk. Yeah, I got to yeah. track it down. But uh, was, but again, if that is in fact, I could document that, snapshot it. Um, where should I submit that? And I mean, nobody I mean, else is open, having yeah. it, is what you're saying. That's what's odd. I mean, I, you know, I, I, 
just a quick search. I'm not turning up something new. Um, okay. So, um, you know, but it could be something specific to, yeah, your combination of the, are you using like um, Mod Apache or are you using PHP FPM? Yes. So like what is your, which, which one? Uh, well, it's Apache with uh, uh, the, I should be F, F, P, FPM enabled. Okay. So you're not using, I don't, I don't even know if Mod Apache is still a thing at this point. Um, I guess it is. I got to go back and check which modules were installed. Um, right. Anyway, I'm just, you know, so it could be if, like if you're doing, if you're deploying PHP in a way that isn't covered by, you know, the Drupal test test system, right? They might not have caught this bug. Um, well, is an FPM yeah, supported? What... Oh, FPM, I would say, is definitely supported. That, uh, I'm just wondering if you're running FPM or you're running with Mod Apache to get PHP or Mod, mod PHP under Apache. I mean. Um, I'll have to look. Uh, I'm not a wizard, so that, okay. that's a. A little outside. Uh, you, you guys are more familiar with that stuff than I am. I thought um, you were a wizard this yeah. whole time. <laughs> Windows. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Windows guy. <laughs> yeah. I've, been, I've been spending a lot of time uh, relearning uh, Linux here. So, yeah. uh, uh, so I. Uh, so you said Apache? What I, I can? Well, yeah. Whether it's running as an Apache PHP is running as an Apache module, or whether you're running. PHP FPM, which is it's like a standalone process, and then Apache would basically be proxying to it. And at that point, PHP doesn't care if you're running Apache or Nginx or whatever other web server. No, it's not. It's not. It is, it is a, a Apache mod. Um, it, not Nginx. Right. So. Right, but but what I'm saying is, if you run PHP FPM as a standalone process right so you run that and you don't have to have a web server at all it's listening on a socket oh and i see oh, oh no, i see what you're saying no no i don't think so now because i did do the full apaches install config and it's working through there so it's uh probably then the okay. uh, yeah i think i thought there was uh, like a, 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 a module add-on to apache for fpm no am i wrong the i i haven't used apache in quite a while so okay I'm not sure, yeah, how you would do that, or whether you just use like the reverse, the proxy capability of Apache. All right. Well, I, I have something to look at then. That's that's the main thing. Just yeah. point me in a direction to yeah. check a couple things, and I'll turn on the uh, log also. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it, yeah, definitely turning in the log would be helpful. Um, and then. Yeah, I don't. Um, I don't think what else. I'd, if there's anything else I've been working that's interesting. I. Um, yeah, ran into an interesting bug that probably most people won't of. Uh, does anyone else use Behat uh, for testing? Mm, yeah. Um, like. So ran into a problem where uh, we're building up something that might be of interest and we might put it on backcountry.org. So there's like a, someone posted a core patch to basically uh, mirror the node access system into a system for custom entities. Um, so that you could basically define very specific access controls of your custom entity types. Um, and so there's writing a hat test for this and it turned out like if, the B hat test where the if you enable the module during the during the test itself, it like you wouldn't get the node or the entity access records written out. Um there's something funny about the way, you know, because I guess we had you know the PHP process is already running or Drupal's already bootstrapped. Yeah, uh, you know, oh, sure. had, um like it didn't pick up on you know the newly enabled hooks or the whatever. Um but that's that's been interesting. I don't know if that's something that anyone else is, finds they have a need for. Uh, part of our motivation is just the scaling. That like, even though like Core's node access system isn't beautiful, like we need 
we know that it can scale <laughs> to you know a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand nodes and not die. Okay. Um, and so um, having if if we think okay, well we might have you know custom entities that start to get to that same scale. Uh, we want like a system that we already know is going to handle it, um, as opposed mm -hmm. to like inventing something different for custom entities. So, okay, maybe um, I don't I don't know if people care enough about the node access system to, that we should do a uh, talk on that sometime. I w I'd go for it. I mean, yeah, I yeah. listened to it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. What do you think, Sean? I mean. It's not it's not like something you do very often of like writing a custom node access model or something else. So right. but if you need it, it's it's handy to know how to do. Well, uh, it, an overview of it certainly would be interesting without getting into maybe the gory details. Yeah. Um, Try to convince Akshan to do a talk about it since she's probably theoretically still the maintainer of taxonomy access control. Um Um, I'm going to do a quick plug for the fact that our 2023 playlist is up on YouTube. All right. Uh, All right. So if you haven't seen what didn't go or did go and wanted to see some other things from Drupal Camp New Jersey, which was held last month, all that content stands a few sessions that we didn't quite get uh, are on YouTube. Uh, for people to view, review and watch whenever you're ready for it. Um, if there's any topics uh, that you want to talk about, ask about at an upcoming uh, meetup, definitely drop us a line uh, wherever we're hiding. Uh, we are on meetup, obviously, but you can also find us in the Drupal Slack, which is at drupal.org slash Slack. Does that actually take you where I wanted to go? Um, Does it really? Direct you to the right page. All right. Yeah, it's For like sure. join something or other. Is there any other access to be? I mean, I I don't want to pay for Slack, uh, because it's it's free. Oh, it is. Yeah, you, that's another you, place. Oh, it's to free. Assistance. Yeah. <laughs> As a user, you don't pay anything. It's the organization that pays. And the Drupal Association, I don't, I don't know. Did they get a deal with with Slack? They were grandfathered in during the pandemic, but I don't know what the status of it is. Um, right. Because like I know the WordPress community is yeah. like free in there or something. Um, hmm. But like, yeah, so I there was right. some some question about it because as the part of the event organizers group, they were running their own Slack. So the messages limit didn't get hit as frequently. But then we moved to the main Slack because right. you know, it was very few people over there. So Well, Slack changed it from being a message limit to being a time-based. Yeah, so that uh, all changed so you... anyway. Oh, so really? Knows? All right. Because yeah. right. I remember there was a, I was at the point where I was having to like pay to see anything else. And I just said, you know, to just... No, that shouldn't be the case. It should okay. be free. Yeah, right. not as an end user. No. You might, I mean, you might not be able to view messages more than three months old. Yeah, well, that's, that's probably... That's true okay. of everyone. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. All right, that sounds good. Yep. All right. And All right, I'll dig a little more, see what I can, maybe I'll drop you a line. Yeah, but definitely get on there, because if, yeah, if you uh, are investigating and need, uh, need pointers, it would be a good place to, to reach out to us. Yeah, I posted Got the it. link to the join link, <laughs> which is join hyphen join Slack. Slack. Yeah. Slack takes you to a okay. page telling you to go there, kind of what it is, or something like that, so... Okay. All right. But uh, we'll talk it. to you all next month then. Have a all good right. one. Okay. Thanks much. All, all right. right. Appreciate it. Bye. Thanks.